Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, my name is Jacob Hoffman Andrews. I'm a senior staff technologist at EFF and a technical lead uh, at Let's Encrypt. Uh, EFF is the leading nonprofit defending civil liberties in the digital world. Uh, Let's Encrypt is a free, open, and automated certificate authority, or CA. I'll often say CA for short. I'm here to tell you the story of a vulnerability disclosure a tricky deprecation process, and how we got through it all with a little help from our friends. Uh, hopefully by the end you'll have learned a little about maintaining reliable software for millions of users. Uh, our goal with Let's Encrypt is to encrypt the whole web. When we started the project, it was expensive and difficult to get a certificate. We could solve the expensive with free certificates, but uh, if we didn't also solve the complicated, we wouldn't succeed, uh, because complicated is just another kind of expensive. So we built Let's Encrypt based on ACME, the Automated Certificate Management Environment, uh, which is just a retronym. We like the name ACME. Uh, and ACME is an IETF protocol designed in tandem with Let's Encrypt to uh, automate certificate issuance, including the validation of domain names. So before a certificate authority can issue you a certificate, they have to validate that it's actually your domain name or that you control that domain name that they're issuing for. Um, so an Acme cert client like CertBot can get a certificate with basically no human intervention and can renew it automatically. Um, so an automated renewal is particularly important because you've probably seen lots of expired certificate warnings on the web. And we really want to keep those to a minimum. And most of those are basically just a human forgot to renew it. So by automating things, we can solve that a lot. Uh, so our dream from the start was that you could just apt install CertBot or yum install CertBot, run it, and you would just have certs for all your sites and you would never have to worry about it again. Uh, you wouldn't have to edit config files, figure out what a certificate chain is and which type of PEM file you needed to install. Um, overall, I think this has been a pretty successful dream. Uh, one of the particularly great things about Acme is that it standardized a set of validation methods called challenges. Uh, these methods are a way you prove to the Acme server, like Let's Encrypt, uh, there are other Acme servers now too, uh, that you really control the domain name. Before Acme, the domain validation processes were ad hoc. Uh, a CA might ask you to put a specific file on your web server in a certain place, uh, or put a token in your domain's DNS, uh, or email a secret token to a special address, uh, like admin at your domain, or postmaster at your domain, or certmaster at your domain. Uh, but CAs differ on where the file should go, or where in DNS that token should go, or which special address they would email the token to. Uh, so it made it hard to apply experience from one CA to another CA, but also more importantly, it made it, uh, it, it this resulted in some security vulnerabilities because uh, site admins couldn't know all the places that they had to lock down, like which email addresses at their domain did they have to protect, which file paths did they have to protect, and so on. Um, that's still the case, but ACME, that's still the case for non-ACME CAs, uh, but uh, slowly I think the situation will get better. Um, and so within ACME that's standardized, and if you're using an ACME client, the ACME client knows exactly where to put the file. Uh, so in ACME for file validation, you know the file will always go under slash dot well known slash acme validation um, and slash dot well known is a uh, kind of a, an umbrella for places to put special files uh, so there's a lot of newer standards that say if you want to specify a thing about your web server put it under slash dot well known so the idea is that if you're running a server you probably want to restrict the ability for untrusted users to upload files to that location um, for DNS validation, the token would go in a text record at uh, underscore acmechallenge.example.com. Um, and we come to the subject of the talk, TLS SNI01. Uh, so this is one of the three methods of proving control of a domain that we launched with. And it's based on uh, certificates and TLS. So TLS stands for Transport Layer Security, uh, formerly known as SSL or Secure Sockets Layer. And it's the encryption layer that underpins HTTPS, as well as a number of other encrypted protocols. SNI stands for server name indication. Uh, and SNI is uh, the way that 
when you connect to a site using uh, HTTPS, for instance, your browser sends, this is the name of the site I want to connect to. Uh, this is useful because a single server on a single IP address might actually host thousands of sites. And that server needs to be able to give you the correct certificate for the site you're visiting among all those thousands. Um, so uh, it's kind of like virtual hosting uh, for TLS. Uh, there's also virtual hosting at the HTTP la layer, and they normally play together really closely, but they're not exactly the same. Uh, so SNI is an extension, it's, it's a special header that, or not a header, it's a field that gets sent as part of the TLS handshake when you connect over TLS. Um, so for TLS SNI, Acme specifies that the CA should generate a token, the client should generate a self-signed certificate that encodes that token, uh, and uh, encodes it in the list of domain names. Uh, to, and to validate this, the Acme server requests the certificate. So the Acme server looks up the IP address of that domain name, connects to it over TLS, and it sends a client hello, which is a, one of the TLS handshake messages, uh, with an SNI field containing that encoded token. So uh, here's an example token. This is shortened for brevity, but blah, 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 dot, Acme, dot, invalid. Uh, and we expect to get back that certificate. Uh, if the Acme server doesn't get back that certificate, that means you probably didn't control that host and you weren't able to upload a certificate to prove that you controlled it. Um, the reason we use dot Acme, dot, invalid is the uh, SNI, the server name indication value, rather than example.com, you know, the, the actual host that we're trying to connect to, is we want to be, in Acme, you want to be able to continually renew at any time. So you don't want to have to swap out your regular certificate with a broken self-signed certificate every time you renew. Uh, so this lets the web server slash Acme client distinguish validation requests from, from normal traffic. Part of the idea behind TLS SNI was that it could provide a higher level of assurance than HTTP file-based validation. Um, with HTTP validation, if you have, say, an uploading, uh, a piece of uploading software, somebody could upload a file to your server in a location that could act as the validation location. Or you might not even intentionally have a file upload functionality in your web server, but maybe a bug led somebody to be able to upload files. Um, and so if that was the case with HTTP-based validation, somebody could use that bug to um, prove that they control your domain name and they could get a certificate for you. Uh, the idea behind TLS SNI is that it's harder to exploit bugs in such a way that you can actually install a certificate on somebody's web server. It usually requires a higher level of privilege. You usually need root to install a certificate. Um, so. That worked pretty well for uh, several years. Uh, unfortunately, in January 2018, uh, Franz Rosen of Detectify, who's a security researcher, found a vulnerability in the TLS SNI validation method, uh, and specifically how it interacted with some hosting providers. Uh, if a hosting provider allows users to upload a certificate without the user proving they control the corresponding domain, uh, an attacker could complete the TLS SNI validation process for domains hosted on that service, even for domains the attacker doesn't control. Uh, to do this, the attacker would ask the Acme server to create a challenge for example.com. The attacker would use that challenge to, uh, would use the token that's part of that challenge to generate a self-signed certificate for the appropriate, for the um, Acme dot for the .acme.invalid uh, domain names and upload it to the hosting provider. The hosting provider would happily serve that certificate uh, via TLS when asked for that particular host name as part of the handshake. Uh, the Acme server would then see that certificate and consider that proof that the attacker actually controlled uh, example.com. Uh, so, uh, I'm pretty happy with our response, actually. Franz uh, reported the issue to our security contact, and within an hour and a half, we had confirmed it and we disabled uh, TLS SNI01 validation for everyone. Uh, and shortly after, we posted about the vulnerability to our community so people would know why suddenly this wasn't available. Um, we spent some time debating the issue and communicating with hosting providers. Um, 
At first, uh, we thought the issue could be resolved uh, purely on the hosting provider side. We thought this was a kind of rare vulnerability that only a few large hosters had. Uh, but eventually, we realized this was actually a really widespread problem. This was a very common behavior. Um, part of the reason for that is that from, the, from a hosting provider's perspective, the main thing that matters with regards to certificates is that they not conflict with each other. You know, the hosting provider can't have two certificates installed for example.com because it won't know what to serve. Uh, but uh, if someone uploads a certificate for the domain they don't control and that isn't already on that hosting provider, like you know, some other example.com, and that's not on the hosting provider, uh, it doesn't really matter so long as some other example.com's DNS doesn't point at that hosting provider. You know, say you're on, say example.com is on Bluehost and some other example.com is on Heroku. You know, it doesn't matter if there's a certificate hanging out over here on Bluehost that uh, is valid for some other domain because nobody's ever going to reach that during normal traffic. But that assumption breaks down and with TLS SNI validation. Um, and since TLS SNI 01 uses certificates ending in .acme and .invalid, they never conflict with existing certificates. Um, Franz Rosen expressed this nicely. Uh, because the validation request, the TLS handshake, doesn't actually contain the domain name being validated, it fails to create a strong binding between the challenge token and the domain name. So we concluded TLS SNI was broken. However, there's a huge base of installed Let's Encrypt clients using uh, getting certificates with TLS SNI. Uh, because these clients automatically renew their certificates 30 days before they expire, we had a few weeks before people's certificates had, were going to start expiring but we had to figure something out before then. Because uh, then websites would start breaking, people would get those expired certificate errors that we want to avoid so much. Uh, the CertBot team started working rapidly on supporting HTTP challenges as an alternative to TLS SNI. So you know, we were lucky in that Acme already supported multiple validation methods, so we could just switch to another one. Um, the support landed in CertBot 0.21, basically later that month. Uh, but we knew it would be a while before everyone kind of upgraded regularly. So we came up with a compromise. Uh, we would allow renewals by a TLS SNI01, uh, but not new issuances. Uh, if someone had previously proved control of a domain before uh, knowledge of this vulnerability was public, uh, we'd consider that strong enough evidence to continue issuing using, this, uh, using the TLS SNI validation method even though it had this bug. And we also discussed this with the security community and the rest of kind of the CA community, and people seem to agree this is a kind of a sensible compromise. Uh, this minimized risk while also uh, ensuring that Let's Encrypt sites continue to work, or sites using Let's Encrypt, that is. Uh, and then we had time to plan the next steps and with the goal of eventually disabling TLS SNI entirely. Uh, we couldn't keep TLS SNI going forever because the rules for what validation method CAs are allowed to use would eventually change to remove this known vulnerable method. Um, so once we got past the crisis and made sure people's certificates would keep renewing for the next little while, uh, we set out to look at what the future would hold. And we coordinated with IETF, um, I didn't define an idea, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is a standards body that defines many of the standards of the internet, including TLS and including ACME. Um, we coordinated with the IETF to design a replacement for TLS SNI, which came to be called uh, TLS ALPN01. Uh, ALPN stands for Application Layer Protocol Negotiation, uh, and so ALPN was designed as part of HTTP2. Uh, so in regular HTTP, if you wrap it in TLS, you do your TLS handshake and then there's regular HTTP inside. Because HTTP2 is uh, such a different format than HTTP, um, it's actually useful during the TLS handshake to be able to say, this is the protocol I'm gonna speak next. I'm not gonna actually speak HTTP, I wanna speak HTTP2. And this is also a signaling method for the server to be able to say, I support HTTP2. Um, but ALPN is pretty extensible. You can, you know, it supports any number of future protocols. So we defined a protocol specifically for validation. Uh, so as uh, part of TLS ALPN, uh, 
challenge validation, uh, the TLS handshake uh, now includes the host name being validated, uh, and it includes the uh, ALPN extension acme-tls slash one. So uh, essentially the Acme server, when it's doing validation says, I want this domain name, but also I want to speak this protocol, which is a very trimmed down protocol just for validation. That was basically just give me back this cert. So that uh, solves two problems. One, the web server can continue to serve its regular certificate without showing any errors about self-signed certificates. And two, uh, the, um, the request for validation actually includes the host name that we're validating. So that creates the stronger binding. And three, the way ALPN works, if your web server doesn't recognize ALPN, you're gonna get an error rather than potentially sending a certificate you didn't mean to send. So it's fail, fails closed, it's more secure. Um, in July 2018, we deployed support for TLS ALPN. Uh, we wanted to take some more time for people to try out the new challenge type and upgrade their CertBot installations before we announced a deprecation date. Uh, in October, we announced that all TLS SNI support, uh, including renewals, would end in February, that was, uh, February of this year, 2019. Uh, and uh, at this point, we wanted to email everyone who's still using TLS SNI and let them know they needed to find a way to upgrade. However, we ran into a problem. Uh, there were a lot of CertBot users who had upgraded to CertBot 0.21, which supported uh, uh, HTTP 01 validation as an alternative to TLS SNI. Uh, there's one thing I missed that I should explain about TLS ALPN. Uh, Nginx and Apache don't yet support ALPN. Uh, and so the most popular CertBot modes historically collaborate with Nginx and Apache to put up certificates. Um, so, you know, a lot of people ask, why can't CertBot just support TLS ALPN as an alter alternative to TLS SNI? It's because the Nginx and Apache support isn't there. Uh, however, in some of the other modes, like uh, CertBot has a standalone mode where you don't use a web server, that we may support TLS ALPN there. Um, so all these users were on 0.21, uh, uh, but because TLS SNI was still available to them, the CertBot software was automatically picking that one uh, over HTTP 01 because it prioritized that one. Uh, most likely these installations would work just fine once we turned off TLS SNI 01, uh, but there was no way really to be sure because to us it looked like they were still renewing using this old deprecated method. Um, and you know, for all we knew, if they switched to HTTP, there might suddenly be issues there. And we wanted to make sure we gave everybody plenty of advance warning before their sites potentially break or fail to renew. We didn't want this to come as a surprise to anyone. Um, so once we announced the switchover, CertBot released another version, 0.28. And in this version, uh, it would default to using HTTP 01, uh, and it would still have uh, TLS SNI 01 available as a fallback, at least until we turned it off on the server side. Uh, so in theory, after 60 days, we could look at our logs and notify everyone who is still using TLS SNI01 at that point, which would be a smaller set. You know, we didn't want to bother people if they didn't actually have to take any action. So in early January, we sent out our first batch of emails. Uh, this was supposed to go out to about 500,000 people, um, which is a lot. Uh, very quickly, we got some very important feedback, uh, which is that the emails didn't say which domain name was affected. Uh, we uh, had been operating under this model where, oh, most people like run like you know a few servers and they kind of can know where they're running CertBot and they'll just check the version is up to date on all those. But of course, we hadn't realized a lot of people run CertBot on a lot of servers and they have a lot of different versions. And so it was really important to know, okay, which specific servers do I need to check on? Um, and uh, so we quickly updated our email sending tools to include you know, templating by domain name, and we sent out a second batch that uh, listed the affected domains. Uh, another piece of feedback we got from that first batch was, uh, you know, people uh, wanted more step-by-step -step instructions rather than like check that you're upgraded to this version. Uh, it was, you know, okay, how do I check that? How do I know which version I'm running? Uh, so we had kind of a three-step instructions: check that you're running the latest version, do a test renewal. Uh, and you know there was one last fiddly step to make sure you weren't actually using TLS SNI even on 0.28. But because we had let it get so late, 
before sending out emails about the deprecation, you know, trying to email as few people as possible. A lot of people said, you know, this is too short. You know, you're sending me email in mid-January and the deadline is in mid-February, which we were, you know, is legit and we took that to heart. So we pushed the date back and uh, our turnoff date was mid-March, uh, which is now passed. We've turned it off and uh, I'm happy to say it was pretty successful on the whole. Um, you know, we had a lot of uh, support requests as a result of our email batches, but actually when the date happened, there wasn't a huge increase in people saying, oh, my site is broken, I need help to fix it now. Um, one of the uh, most common problems we saw, though, is that people who are running long-term support releases uh, of their Linux distributions were stuck on very old versions of CertBot. Um, so a long-term support release is a version of a Linux distro that's designed to be released once and not updated. So if you were building your software stack on top of it, things aren't going to change and break out from under you. Um, but at the same time, the LTS releases are intended to get security, security fixes backported into them. Uh, but what that means is when software gets bundled into those releases, often it's on a relatively old version, or especially for new software, it's quite old. So for instance, uh, on Ubuntu 16.04, Xenial, uh, they still had CertBot 0.4, which was from the very early days of uh, CertBot shortly after we launched. Uh, and uh, that version didn't support HTTP validation. So we knew once we turned off TLS SNI, people on Ubuntu 16.04 Xenial, who installed from the OS packages, they would be broken unless they like used a different mode, like standalone mode. So we'd been working with packagers of Ubuntu to get updates approved for a couple of years. Um, but the packagers are facing a tricky balance. Uh, you know, once, they're, once the LTS uh, release is released, they generally don't accept backports except for security up, uh, updates. Uh, with TLS SNI being deprecated, you know, I think there's a pretty good argument that an update was required for security because otherwise your certificates would go away. Um, but uh, distributions are naturally cautious about accepting updates to LTS releases if there's a chance to break existing installations. Um, and so, for instance, you know, newer versions of CertBot have dependencies on other libraries like Python cryptography, and upgrading those libraries would require upgrades to, say, OpenSSL, and you, know, you wind up with this complicated chain of dependencies that makes it hard to update things. Um, the promise of LTS is stability at the expense of up-to-dateness. Um, ultimately, though, the impending deprecation date increased the pressure, and the uh, Ubuntu community you know, kind of came around and agreed that we should upgrade this, and we got some great volunteers helping us with that. Uh, so now Ubuntu 16.04 users do have an updated package, uh, which means if they're running automated updates or if they just run an app get update, they'll get a cert bot that can work in today's post TLS SNI world because it supports the HTTP01 challenge for Apache and Nginx. Um, so finally, the day came, March 13th. Uh, we turned off TLS SNI, and thankfully, things mostly worked for most people. Did, uh, did you pick the Ides of March on purpose? No, we didn't. <laughs> we originally picked the Ides of February, and then we pushed it back to March. I'm just pointing out it was a bad day for Caesar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so uh, we had a, we saw a decent number of people coming to the forum asking for help, but it was nothing like the flood of angry users we had worried would happen when we turned it off. Uh, we'll probably see a steady trickle of people switching over until uh, May 13th as their certificates expire. Like I say, if you renewed with TLS SNI on March 12th, you might not actually have your next renewal till May 12th. Um, a, a reminder, by the way, a lot of people think, you know, with Let's Encrypt certificates, because they're 90 day, you have to renew every 90 days. You actually have to renew every 60 days, because if anything goes wrong, we want you to have 30 days to fix it. Um, and so it's particularly important for automated renewals, uh, because, you know, you might not be there when the renewal happens. You might be on vacation or whatever. So we want to make sure by the time you come back, there's still time to fix whatever problem. Um, so... Uh, what lessons have we learned through this process? Uh, first, it's always better to communicate often and early. Uh, we held off on announcing a deprecation date because we were unsure how long it would take to release TLS ALPN. Uh, 
But what we found is that when we did announce the deprecation date, it helped everyone in the ecosystem, including CertBot and the OS packagers, align on a common goal. You know, once people know what the date is, they can make plans and make priorities. Um, if we had announced our deprecation date earlier, everyone would have had more time to fix things and upgrade software. On a similar note, once we did announce the deprecation date, uh, we should have sent the notification emails as soon as possible. Uh, we were trading off between precision, that is emailing the smallest, most accurate number of people possible, uh, versus timeliness. Uh, if we had leaned more heavily on the side of timeliness uh, and give, also given people clear instructions to check how they would be affected so it's not too much burden to get this email and run the instructions, uh, I think the transition would have been less of a burden for many people. Uh, also, we realized when you email a lot of people, you should always do a small batch first. You, know, you can <laughs> proofread your email to death, you can send like dry runs where the emails don't actually get sent, but when those actual emails actually start going out to people, you start getting all this feedback and they're like, oh, I didn't understand this or this wasn't clear or you didn't include this piece of information I needed. Uh, so staged rollouts of emails are really valuable so you can make sure if you're gonna bother 500,000 people, you wanna make sure you're, you give really great instructions and it's really easy for them to figure out what to do. And you didn't get put on spam houses list? And he, we did not get put on spam houses list. Uh, we do use an email service provider uh, that manages um, deliverability and so they make sure they're following all the best practices to not get marked as spam. And of course, everyone who uses Let's Encrypt has you know, given us their email with a specific purpose of this type I'm of communication. I'm people responded to email because if I got an email saying, oh, I'm part of your security infrastructure and you need to do these things, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's really me. And mm. um, I'm gonna... Well, this is sent from uh, an email address from which we regularly send expiration yeah, notices. Yeah. Yeah. Know, but this mm -hmm. is one of those big scary things. And we want you to change things in your security. Exactly. Well, fortunately, the things we want people to change are basically just upgrade your software, which is always a safe, it, generally a safe operation. It's something you should be doing regularly. Yeah, but a lot of times, I don't know what the email looked like, but a lot of times it would be like, and we want you to update the software from here's a link. Yeah. No, we definitely, we do not tell people, go click here and yeah, install this software. It's just, I just want to. Yeah. Um, also, I think one of the most broadly applica applicable lessons I've learned in software engineering over the years is to break dependencies wherever possible. Um, you know, it's easy to conclude that like this task depends on this task, depends on this task, depends on this task, and you have to complete them all in order. Uh, but sometimes with a little extra work or a little extra thought, you can say, you know what, we can do these two things in parallel, uh, which means you can get different people to work on them, or just if one is blocked, you can keep working on the other. Um, and uh, so I think in this particular case, uh, you know, if we had said, okay, the TLS ALPN01 work is independent of announcing a deprecation date for TLS SNI, and you know, if they don't match up exactly, that's fine. I think that could have made this also a much smoother process. Um, and this is a theme that comes up again and again, not just in this type of work, like sending out emails, but if it's like, oh, we're gonna write this module, and then we're gonna write this other module, like, is there any way you can write them at the same time? Or like, make it so it doesn't matter what order you write them in. Um, also, our choice to pursue packaging by OS distributions very early on acted against us. Uh, for instance, Debian 8 was released uh, shortly before Let's Encrypt and CertBot launched. Uh, so CertBot wasn't included in the core distribution, but we really wanted people to have an easy path to insert, install CertBot. You know, this is the latest Debian release. You know, it should be easy to do. Um, so uh, Debian has a backports repo uh, where something that wasn't included in a given release can go in the backports repo and it's a small process for users to activate that repo and install packages from it. So with some helpful volunteers, way back early on we got CertBot into the Debian backports repo, uh, which made it relatively easy for Debian users to install way back then. Uh, however, uh, you know, eventually for any given Debian release, the, the main repo closes and the backports repo closes. So. Uh, the Debian 8 backports repo is now totally closed for new submissions because it's, it's old. You know, this is an old distro, obviously they don't want to support it. Uh, so that means people on Debian 8 are stuck on CertBot 10. So this is, we got updates to most of our OS packages, uh, but at least on Debian 8, people are stuck and will have to manually install CertBot through a separate way. Um, and this is a pattern we've observed with other newish software like Docker and Go. You know, very often the first versions that get packaged into OSs 
wind up hopelessly out of date very quickly because new software evolves quickly and that's that was equally true of certbot and let's encrypt you know obviously we want to release perfect software the first time with no bugs and no protocol changes but uh, it happens um, and you know I think uh, my advice would be if you're developing a new piece of software uh, you should actually try to avoid getting packaged by OS's until you're like maybe three years old because you're probably going to have these breaking changes and you're probably going to wind up not wanting to support early versions but uh, you can really create confusion if the easy path for people to install your software which is through the OS packages gives them uh, out-of-date software uh, and then you often wind up with oh I've installed the out-of-date software, that didn't work. I went to your website, I installed the new software, and now I have two versions that are potentially conflicting. Um, so there are some better options for kind of this newish software. For instance, on Ubuntu, uh, you can create a PPA, which is kind of your own repo where you manage your own release schedule. Ubuntu also now has Snaps, which are another way of distributing software that, that again, you know, is more under your control and less packaged by the OS. Uh, so those are cool ways to bundle new software that you want to keep really up to date for all your users. Um, I don't know what the equivalent is for Debian. I'd be curious to hear if there are good options. It supports Flatpak. Flatpak? Yeah. Cool. I haven't heard of Flatpak. I'll have to look that up. Thank you. Um, you install Snappy in Debian? What's that? Snappy? You install Snappy in Debian? I don't know. Since it's downstream, or it's upstream from Ubuntu. Yeah, it could be. I'll have to look that one up too. Yes. Sweet. Um, so, and on the positive side, a lot of stuff went really well. Uh, one of the things we've been most excited about at Let's Encrypt is that we have a really wonderful, supportive uh, community that goes the extra mile to help other Let's Encrypt users in our forum. Uh, in technical communities, it's all too common to tell people that our questions are too basic or that they should read the manual. Uh, in the Let's Encrypt forum, we really make a big point of being supportive of everyone who comes in with a question, whether they're a complete newbie or a really advanced user. You know, I think valuing kindness in our technical community is really important and valuable. Um, a big part of expanding the use of encryption on the web is expanding the pool of people who know how to deploy it, and building that supportive community I see as a big part of that mission. Uh, disabling TLS SNI meant that a lot of people needed a lot of help all of a sudden and our forum community really stepped up to the task and made sure everybody got the information they needed. Uh, another thing that went really well, uh, once we did start sending out those emails and you know, our deprecation date was clear and um, you know, the need for those updated certbot versions in uh, OS releases became really clear and so uh, some awesome volunteers stepped up and you know, helped get those packages up to date. Uh, so I think that comes back to the theme of when you clearly communicate with people, they can you know, set priorities based on that. Uh, and one of the things I think went really well is uh, we responded really rapidly and decisively to the original security, security incident by shutting off the vulnerable method as soon as we became aware there was an issue. Uh, as a certificate authority, we take our responsibility for internet security very seriously, and this was an occasion where I think we proved it with action. Uh, for users, I think there's also a few lessons for Let's Encrypt and CertBot users. Um, first off, it's a really good idea to provide an email address when you sign up for Let's Encrypt. We intentionally do make it optional. You know, we support anonymity. We don't think you need to have an email address or share an email address to get a certificate. But there's a big benefit to you, which is, you know, first off, you get expiration email. So if your renewal cron job breaks, you'll hear about it. Uh, but also sometimes there's unusual stuff like this where you know, we're going to break you by turning off a, a validation method. Hopefully, this will be a very rare occurrence. But uh, you know, if this uh, you know happens again in the future, we'll email you. Uh, also, deprecations like turning off old versions of the API. Um, having the email is great. Also, occasionally we see people's clients really go out of control uh, and send us thousands of requests per second, and it's great to be able to email them and say, you know, please stop that. Uh, it actually never seems to happen with CertBot, but some other clients, uh, it does happen sometimes. Uh, also, please make sure your software auto-updates. Uh, this is important for security in general, uh, and in the case of CertBot, it will also ensure you stay on the latest version, which ensures you don't have to do special work to fix stuff like this when it breaks. Um, another uh, lesson is about uh, port 80 versus port 443. Um, one of the common issues people ran into when moving from TLS SNI to HTTP is 
the HTTP based validation happens on port 80 with plain text HTTP uh, and they had port 80 blocked on their web server. Now for some people uh, that's blocked by their ISP and they have no control over that uh, for whatever reason. Uh, but we also found some people used a firewall to block port 80 and allow only port 443. Um, the theory being my website is only HTTPS, it's so far HTTPS, all the links are in HTTPS, nobody's ever going to reach it on plain text HTTP. Um, and that's, you know, that's fair, but browsers do still take people to port 80 if they just type in the domain name by default. So it's actually better to serve a redirect, which is convenient for your users, and send them to HTTPS. But more importantly, um, you know, turning off 80 is not going to protect your users against a uh, man in the middle because uh, if somebody's being man in the middle, that attacker can just answer on port 80 as if they're your web server. Um, so it's not a security advantage there. The other security advantage some people uh, posit for turning off port 80 is you know, fewer ports is better. You always want to firewall as tightly as you can. But the underlying logic behind that is you want to know what software is accessible on your network. You, know, you want to make sure people from the outside can't access some piece of software you don't know about on an unknown port. But both 80 and 443 are going to the same software. It's your web server in both cases. So by disabling 80, you don't really reduce the surface area of your web server. You just make things a little more inconvenient for users who type in port 80, and also more inconvenient for yourself in using the uh, HTTP validation method, which replaces TLS SNI. Um, so the secure version of this is allow port 80, always redirect it to HTTPS, and once your users get to HTTPS, you can send them uh, an HTTP strict transport security header. Uh, and this is a header that tells their browser, anytime you visit the site in the future, always use HTTPS, no matter what. Um, and so that's more secure than just turning off port 80. So we ran into that, not because of a bug or anything, but when they were pushing us to go into HTTPS on all of our external websites, mm -hmm. it was like, if we turned off 80, we created a lot of problems. Yep, exactly. We so we had complained, so mm -hmm. we just had 80 redirect. That's great, I'm glad to hear that. This is a best practice. And so we actually, I created a doc page on the Let's Encrypt site to kind of have an authoritative page saying, it's okay to have port 80, this is actually a good thing. Um, so lastly, I want to give big thanks to everyone who helps package CertBot for various distributions, uh, including in particular Harlan Lieberman Berg, Andre Suri, Michael Casadeval, James Hogarth, Nick Babu, Ellie Young, Felix Jan, Julian Christau, Roby Basak, and Christian Earhart. Uh, and I'm sure I've missed some people, uh, so please consider yourself thanked even if you're not on this list. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the Let's Encrypt uh, forum community who has helped so many people through Turbo's deploying a certificate. Matt Nordhoff, uh, Nordhoff Jürgen Auer, Sasanu, John Morahan, Osiris, and Alex Zorin. Uh, they've all put in tons of work and been super supportive of everyone who comes looking for help. Uh, I'd also like to thank my colleagues at Let's Encrypt and CertBot, including Brad Warren, Eric Portnoy, Seth Shun, Yona Hoikala, Adrian Farand, Daniel McCarney, Roland Shoemaker, and the Let's Encrypt SRE team. So that's the story of a deprecation, and I hope you found it informative. Uh, we've got five minutes for questions. So you said you allowed them to continue renewing certs, mm -hmm. yeah. but people couldn't create new ones. Yeah. So what happened if someone tried to make a new one using TLS01? Uh, so the way the Acme flow works is you, your client says to the Acme server, I want a certificate for these names. And the server says, okay, for those names, here are the ways that I'm going to allow you to prove it. Uh, and so uh, before the deprecation, we would say, you know, here's uh, an HTTP challenge, a TLS SNI challenge, and a DNS challenge. And after it would be, here's a DNS challenge and an HTTP challenge, and you can pick one of these two, or a TLS ALPN now. So basically, it's up to the client. The client's going to go looking for one of these methods that it supports. And if the client says, oh, there's nothing here I support, it'll error out. So that there was no point where an end user thought it might work because the server was telling it what the uh, available versions were? Right. I mean, in, in general, you know, the, the way this works for an end user is you're, you run your client and say, I want this, and your client either succeeds or gives you an error. And different clients may give better or worse error messages.
statically link it instead of like operate, updating all of the operating system packages? Yeah, so you know we've had a lot of discussions about how to package Certbot over the years. There's actually, um, so Certbot is in Python, so static linking is, isn't an option, sort of. There's something called PyInstaller uh, that does a similar thing for Python, which is package up a thing and all its dependencies. Um, that's made more complicated by the fact Certbot is in Python, it does actually have some C dependencies, it loads some libraries, and so those would need to be statically linked. We would then need to actually build those for every platform we're available on. Um, so we definitely considered the Py installer route pretty significantly, and we may do something more like that eventually, but it's a lot of build work. Um, one of the other tricky issues about packaging is uh, Debian-based distros, at least, and I'm not sure about Red Hat ones, forbid what's called vendorizing or like bundling your dependencies with your package. Uh, and this is another of these like interesting and tricky trade-offs between security and security. Uh, so the idea is, you know, for instance, OpenSSL had this Heartbleed vulnerability, which I'm sure you heard about years ago. Uh, if every package on your system had its own copy of OpenSSL, you'd have to wait for each package to update to incorporate that. And some packages aren't you know, maintained very avidly, and so they might never get updates. Whereas if your OS, if there's just one copy of that library on your OS, OS once that upgrades, everything is fixed in theory. Um, so that is good for security. It's also good for saving disk space, but that's less of a concern these days. On the other hand, it can be bad for security because it can hold things back. Uh, so for instance, in this case, you know, on older distros, even once we were able to upgrade, you know, we couldn't upgrade past a certain point because we had an increased dependency on uh, Pi cryptography, which had an increased dependency on OpenSSL, and OpenSSL couldn't be updated because everything depended on the older version. So uh, the inability to vendor stuff makes it harder to keep other software up to date on older releases. Um, and the virtual environment? Yeah, so. Uh, is that possible? Or? I, it's a good question. Uh, PIP is not one of our officially supported methods of installing Certbot, although it does exist. Uh -huh. um, and I, uh, I don't directly work on Certbot, so I can't remember what the exact difficulties are with PIP, but it's not quite ideal. Um, the. Currently, officially recommended alternative on older distros is called Certbot-Auto, which um, downloads its own copy of Certbot and installs a bunch of dependencies that it needs. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much for coming to this talk.